Good morning. This morning we're in John chapter 11. John chapter 11. I invite you to turn to John chapter 11. It's the same story as we shared for the children's story. But we're going to go through it in a little more detail and a little more carefully. And it's a little bit of a journey. And I want to take you on this journey into the mind and into the heart of Mary and Martha in particular. And end off with some encouraging thoughts about God's intentions and God's plans for our lives. John chapter 11. And we're just going to read through this and pause every now and then, every once in a while, to capture the mood and the setting and what's going on. It starts like this. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. And you will find that story, incidentally, in the first part of chapter 12. When Jesus heard that, sorry, verse 3, Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Jump down to verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. I want you to notice here that as John begins this story, this historically accurate story, by the way, he begins this story by trying to paint a picture of the kind of relationship that exists between Jesus and these two sisters and brother, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And in numerous places in these first five verses, the author John is trying to point out the fact that this was no casual acquaintance. It was no, um, you know, blasé sort of once in a while, I've met this person, don't know them very intimately, just know who they are, I recognize their face, I know their name, but that's about as far as it goes. John is countering that idea, he's painting a picture here of a Jesus who knows this family intimately. He's painting a picture of a family which knows Jesus intimately. Notice this language here. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil, wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. And again, when you turn over the page and you go to chapter 12 and you see the scenario and the setting, you see a Mary who is deeply uh, in love with Jesus because she realizes what he has done for her. It was no casual, ordinary relationship. It was no mere acquaintanceship. There is such a word. This was a real, deep, interpersonal, personal relationship. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil, wiped his feet with her hair. Um, it says here, the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now, I see a little bit of emotional blackmail there. I see a little bit of psychology involved there. The Yarra is Jesus far away from where they are. This is the Jesus who had uh, lived in their home. He had stayed over there. You know, this home was the place where when all, you know, when all was going wrong in the bigger, wider, badder world around Jerusalem, because you will notice that a little while later on it says that Bethany was only two miles from Jerusalem. And when you go through the gospel accounts, you get this very clear picture that a lot of bad stuff happened to Jesus in Jerusalem. You know, numerous times he almost lost his life there. Numerous times he tried to preach, he tried to teach, he tried to heal the sick, he tried to do things that the leaders did not like, they did not approve of, because he was gaining more popularity than them. Numerous times the Bible says that they took up stones to stone him, but Jesus escaped from them. It says that they plotted how they might go out and take Jesus in secret and kill him. It says in numerous places that here in Jerusalem, the place where he should have been welcome, in this town that's centered around, you know, the idea of salvation that had the sanctuary system and its sacrifices all illustrating the very work that Jesus himself was now coming to do, that this very place was a death trap for Jesus. 
But two miles away in a little town of Bethany, that's where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived. It was that Lazarus, the Bible says, who Jesus loved. And they used this with Jesus. You see, at present, he's far away. He's left Jerusalem. He's left Bethany. He's working amongst another group of people in some distant town. Lazarus is dying. And so Mary and Martha send a message to Jesus because they're not in the direct presence of Jesus. You and I today are not in the direct presence of Jesus. There is a separation that sin has brought. And we have contact with Jesus through the experience of prayer. We're told in Romans chapter 8 that it is the Spirit which makes intercession for us. That we send our messages and our prayers via the agency and the working of the Holy Spirit, a messenger, into the presence of Jesus. Are you seeing a parallel here between the historical story and what you and I go through on a daily basis? They are separated from the direct presence of Jesus, so they send a messenger with a message for Jesus to come and assist them in their time of trouble. In the same way that you and I appeal to God through prayer and through the mediation of the Holy Spirit to assist us in our time of trouble, in our time of difficulty. And in their prayer, in their message, they try and paint this picture as, as beautifully as they can. And they try and persuade the Lord that if there was ever a time they needed an answer to prayer, it was now. If there was ever a situation that demanded his immediate and his most powerful, you know, drop everything else and come running, it was now. Because this was no ordinary acquaintance, Jesus. You were working out there amongst the strangers. You've gone into towns and meeting people you've never met before. You're healing the sick uh, uh, people again you've never met before. You have no prior emotional commitment to them, no prior engagement with them. Don't forget who we're asking on behalf of. Does that sound like some of our prayers? <laughs> this is no ordinary friend. This is Lazarus, Lord. The subtle innuendo, the subtle implication of what they're saying is, Lord, you owe it to him. Remember that this is the home where you have spent many an hour. Remember that this is the safe place you've been able to lay your head when everybody else is trying to kill you. This is your friend, Lazarus, whom you love. Do you get that emotion? Do you get that psychology coming through? The author John is painting a picture that it was a very valid argument, in fact, because he knew them well and they knew him well. No ordinary acquaintance. You know, it sets us up in the beginning of the story to expect that Jesus is going to drop everything. That surely, once he knows you well, you become priority. You know what they say, it's not what you know, but who you know. So when I'm in trouble, and as long as I'm Jesus' friend, things will go well. Because I know him. He knows me. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Again, John is setting the stage here for a contrast. Emphasizing the point that whatever happens next, it was not for lack of love. It was not because they misunderstood their relationship to him. It wasn't because it was all built on lies and it never really existed. Jesus loved Mary and Martha. Lazarus, whom you love, is sick. And I just love this. Verse 5 and then verse 6. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. Now what we would expect to follow in verse 6 is, So because of this love, he dropped everything and returned to Bethany. He sent the strangers home, you know, the ones that, that he owed nothing to, as it were, and he sent those strangers home, those mere acquaintances, and rushed home to be with the family. Surely that's what the priority will be. But it's not what it says. It's quite the opposite. Jesus loved Mary and Martha, so when he heard that, instead of dropping everything, when he heard that he, that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Jesus, help us. And remember who we are. We are not the heathen out there. We are not the pagan. We are not the ones who have never loved you or obeyed you or worshipped you or any of that. We are your family. 
And right now, your family is in need. Come quickly. And then the Bible says, so because he loved them, he didn't come. Doesn't it beg the question? Well, how does that work? Surely if you love your family, they are your priority. Surely if this whole thing is as the gospel writer is saying, then Jesus would have come immediately, but he doesn't. And yet the Bible writer says it's got nothing to do with the fact that Jesus didn't love them. He loved Mary and Martha. And yet when he hears that, he stays two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus says, yes, we're going there again. We skip over a few verses here. He gets into this dialogue with his disciples. He says, I go to Bethany now. We're returning there. We're going to go and see Lazarus. He's sleeping. I must wake him up. The disciples say, well, if he's sleeping, that's a good sign. He's going to get better. We don't need to disturb him. After all, if you go to Judea, you're probably going to get killed. So if Lazarus is getting better and he's sleeping, let's let him rest and let's keep ourselves out of trouble. Let's stay here where we are. It's a lot more peaceful. You seem to be accepted here. Jesus turns to them and says, no, You've misunderstood what I'm saying. Lazarus is not sleeping the mere sleep of restoration. He is dead. And I go that I may wake him. Now the disciples have been given an insight into what he intends to do when he gets there. But Mary and Martha still know nothing, right? It says in verse 17, When Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now again, I just love this. You've got to do the math here. This means that Jesus was at best four days late and at worst up to six or seven days late. Because the message is sent while Lazarus is still alive, right? The message is not that Lazarus has died, come quickly. The message is that Lazarus, your friend, the one whom you love, is sick. So Lazarus is still alive when Jesus receives this message. There's assumedly enough time for Jesus to come back and heal the sick man. And thus Jesus delays by two days. Could we say it almost looks at this point as if Jesus wanted Lazarus to die? Could you say that about Jesus? Strange idea. He deliberately delays by two days. When he gets there, the man's already had his funeral. He's in the grave four days. So by my calculation, minimum four days late, possibly five or six days late. And again, it begs the question. You're our friend. You've slept in our home. We've made a commitment to you. You've made a commitment to us. Okay, you didn't answer the prayer for, for restoration of the sick, but you could have at least showed up for comfort at the hour of our greatest hurt and our greatest pain when we're burying our beloved one. But you're not there. And sometimes it's going to feel the same to you and I, friends. We may pray, send our message on the wing of one who intercedes on our behalf through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Our prayers reach God. They are heard by God. Notice in this story, it wasn't that the message failed to get there. The message arrived. And all our prayers are heard by God because of the merits of Jesus Christ. They arrive in heaven's postal system. He reads every letter. He knows our cares. He knows our concerns. And yet sometimes, like with Mary and Martha, he doesn't answer what we've asked for. Now now understand this. Not only did they have a good connection with God, with Jesus, not only was there a mutual two-way relationship between them, but on top of that all, he hears their prayer and they have asked for what they genuinely believe is the right thing. They have asked not something selfishly. They have not asked that they might be healed. They have not asked for anything that would be for their personal gain. They are simply seeking the health and the well-being of their beloved brother. Would that classify in this category of asking in Jesus' name? And yet, he not only doesn't answer their prayer the way they've prayed it, he doesn't show up for comfort to the funeral. What kind of a friend is this Jesus? 
You've promised to be with me through thick and through thin, from beginning to end. I will always be there. I'll never forsake you, you've said. And now in our hour of greatest need, you have not come to visit us. You have not condescended to be with us. You haven't even come to comfort us. You didn't even send a note ahead saying, I'm going to be late, but I will be there. It just seems deathly quiet. You can see them asking the messenger, did you ask, did, did you remember, did you remember to point out that it's Lazarus, the one whom you love? Did you put that phrase in there? Yes, I put that phrase in there. So where is Jesus? Lazarus is busy dying. His breathing is last. He hasn't come. Where is he? Now he's dead. Now we're devastated. We're disappointed. We don't understand why he has not heard our prayer or why he has not answered our prayer. But I'm sure he'll be here in a little while to comfort us. Time for the funeral comes and goes. I'm sure the comfort is coming. Maybe he couldn't make it to the funeral. Maybe those Jews got hold of him again. Maybe he got delayed. Maybe he's hiding somewhere for the fear of his life. I don't know, but there must be a reason. Okay, he's going to be here soon. One day. Two days. Three days. Four days. No messenger in return. No letter of indication. Silence. Have you ever been at a place in your life like that? You've prayed. You've begged. You've pleaded. You've bargained with God. You, you've searched your motives. You've asked whether you're asking for the right thing. I know it's not asking for myself. I'm begging you, God. I'm pleading with you. I've given you my life. I've surrendered everything. I turned away from my sin. I know I'm not holding on to anything. I am your friend. You have accepted me. You have called me. Here I am. I've served you. I've given you my life. But where are you? You haven't answered my prayer. What now? I'm in this place of disappointment. I'm in this place of darkness. I don't know where to turn. At least give me some... Okay, you haven't answered my prayer, but at least give me some ray of hope to hang on to. Some form of comfort. Silence. Nothing. What do you do? What do you do when you are in that place? It was quiet. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews who joined the women around Martha and Mary, they were there to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Another verse, by the way, which we pass over very quickly when you read the story and you don't stop to analyze and to put yourself in that place and to realize the emotion and the psychology and, the, and, and the everything that's going on in Martha's head. Jesus is four days late. He sent no sort of warning, no indication, no explanation. Now he comes. The man's dead and buried. He's rotting in the grave already. Now Jesus comes and Mary runs or Martha runs to him, grabs hold of him and says, where were you? That's Webster's paraphrase. Why weren't you there in our hour of greatest need? You see, when she says that if you were here, my brother would not have died. She's, she's insinuating blame, isn't she? You see, God, you could have prevented this. We sent you the message. We prayed on time. We did everything we needed to do. You had the power. You are the Almighty. We don't deny any of that stuff. You could have done something, but you didn't. And if you had been here, we would not have suffered this loss. We would not be broken now. We would be rejoicing. We would be praising you as the miracle worker. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Where were you? Why am I experiencing this? Where? And now you've got to notice this about Martha. She knows all the right doctrine. She's doctrinally accurate. She knows what scripture teaches about what happens when you die and when the resurrection is. Because as Jesus gets into a dialogue with her, he says to in verse 23, your brother will rise again. To which she responds, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. 
So she knows what happens when you die. She believes in the future resurrection. She has all these doctrinally correct understandings. But you want to know, if you've ever gone through this, this kind of loss, this kind of pain, you will know that having all the right knowledge and understanding may help in some way. But it does not necessarily take away the emotion of the moment. And young Martha runs up to Jesus and she cries out in her pain and in her brokenness a, a, a question, a, a, a statement which insinuates blame on Jesus, but it's the emotion of her heart. She pours it out on him and says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. My brother would not have died. And how does Jesus deal with her? Because I know that when my wife says things that imply my fault in a situation. I don't take kindly to that. <laughs> right, men? Like when you know you're lost? And your wife says something like, if you'd let me stop and ask that guy, or maybe it's more serious than those sort of situations. <laughs> How do you react when somebody places the blame on you? Pride comes up, right? The defensive attitude comes up. Here is the God of the universe in human flesh who has come to give his life for humanity as a testimony to his love for them. And this mere sinful mortal who only sees as far as her, you know, the dark cloud of her pain will let her see, which is not very far, it is not the big picture, insinuates to him who has left heaven above that he is to blame for her brother's death. I tell you what, she can be lucky I'm not God. I wouldn't have taken kindly to that. But it's a beautiful picture of Jesus. And I thank God that he's different to me. Because all he does is he lets her express her pain. Let's her express her lack of understanding, her doubt, even although it, <clears throat> even although it comes out as, as, as a statement of blame. He simply lets her be where she is. He doesn't rebuke her. He doesn't get on his high horse about who do you think you are? Don't you know the promises? Where's your faith? He's patient and he listens. And he tolerates and he empathizes. But notice this, he still doesn't give her the answers. Jesus is there. He's arrived. She has questions. And all Jesus had to say to make all of this just magically disappear was, Martha, we're heading over to the grave now to resurrect your brother. Quit your crying, woman. Wipe away the tears. There's no reason. We're headed. We're going to fix it all now. We're going to go and make it right. But that's not what he does. He says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? You see, there was something more important for Martha to gain out of this experience than merely having Jesus erase the pain and the suffering. Before he fixes her problem, before he's willing to you know, remedy the, the, the actual situation, he asks her, do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? In the midst of her pain and in the midst of her suffering, Jesus gives her a greater, more enduring answer to the situation than merely erasing what happened. 
He directs her to the, to the person of who he is. He wants her to look through the pain, through the darkness, through the cloud. He wants her to, to transcend that and realize who's standing in her presence. He doesn't just want to give her her brother back. He wants her to take hold of him. Do you understand the difference? It's not just about fixing your brokenness, but in the brokenness, taking hold of Jesus. Once you have Jesus, everything else can fit back into place. But without holding on to Jesus in the midst of the brokenness and the pain, having the situation fixed is not the ultimate solution. It's like a Band-Aid. It fixes the symptoms. It takes away the pain, but it doesn't necessarily give you what you need more than anything else. And so before he takes her to a remedy of the situation, he leads her into an encounter with himself. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Do you understand this? Do you accept me? Are you loyal to me? Even although you don't have the answers to your problems. You don't know why this has happened. You don't understand what I have told the disciples that I'm coming to resurrect you know, your brother. You don't know the big picture. You don't realize I have a plan here that I'm working on. Will you still trust me? While you're broken on your knees before me, will you still say, yes, you are the resurrection and the life. Yes, you are the Messiah. Yes, you are the one I will trust in. While I don't have the, question, the answers to my questions. And sometimes it's the same for us, friends. There is no one that can tell you the whys. You've searched, you've hunted high and low. You've asked the pastor, you've asked the elders, you've asked yourself, you've asked God. You've searched the scriptures and still you do not find an answer that will appeal to your intellect. That will say, oh, because of this and because of that, that's why that must have happened. Or because this happened, it's in preparation for that. I don't know. I don't have the big picture. You don't have the big picture. All you know is your pain. All you know is your brokenness. All you have are the questions. You have no answers. And before God will rest Remedy your situation. He says to you, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. And even if he does die, he will be resurrected again. Do you believe this? And notice her response. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah. You are the one sent of God. You are the son of God who is come into the world. Yes, despite my lack of understanding, despite all the questions I have and the lack of answers that I have, I will still trust you. I will still commit my life to you. I will still follow you. This is, this is Martha's equivalent of Job saying, though he slay me, though he kill me himself, I will still trust him. Because I have settled the issue in my mind as to the character of God. I understand that when I look at the cross, when I, when I look at the fact that he left heaven in search of me, that no matter what brokenness this life brings, I know one thing for sure, beyond all the pain and beyond all the suffering, I cannot doubt the love of God and the goodness of God. I still don't have the answers. I still can't answer all the questions. I still don't know the whys and the wherefores, but I will cling to him no matter what. Verse 28, when she had said these things, she went her way, secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. And deja vu, it happens all over again. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. The Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she must be going to the tomb to weep there. Let's go with her. Verse 32, then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Same question, same emotional turmoil. Martha still doesn't have the answer. She still doesn't know where this whole thing is going. She still doesn't know that Jesus is about to resurrect her brother. But she has found some degree of peace and comfort being in the presence of God, affirming her belief in him, realizing that God is good all the time, even in unanswered pain and unanswered suffering. She commits herself to that. She goes and calls her sister. Her sister comes. Mary comes. They still don't have the answers. They still don't know what's coming. They still don't know how Jesus is going to remedy the situation. And Mary goes through the same experience as, as Martha has gone through. Blames Jesus. It's your fault. You could have. You had the power. You didn't intervene. Therefore, that makes you an accomplice to this whole situation and everything that's happened. Wow. 
Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And therefore, when the Jews saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, sorry, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now, you very seldom see Jesus ruffled or troubled. The one other instance that comes to mind is just over the page in chapter 12, verse 27, where he's going to the cross and he says, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. You know, the mind is playing games. He's losing that sense of peace. There's that sense of trouble, that anxiety that wells up in the human heart. You very, when they took up stones to stone him, he just casually slipped out of their way. When they castigated him and they cursed him and they swore at him and they denied him and they did all sorts to him. Never says he was troubled or that he groaned in his spirit. And now here in this story, he looks at Mary and Martha. He sees the gathered crowds weeping in their brokenness and in their pain. And he's troubled. It says he groaned in his spirit. You don't often see that picture of Jesus. He said, where have you laid him? So they said to him, Lord, come and see. In the shortest verse in the Bible, two words, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of the others said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? <laughs> the crowd is in the same place as Mary and Martha. They've got questions they don't have answers for. He's healed the sick. He's raised the dead. We've seen it all before. And here is his friend, no casual acquaintance, and he lets him die. Hmm. And Jesus groans in his spirit. He weeps. And verse 38 again says, again, groaning in himself, he came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Why was Jesus groaning? Why did he weep? And I think there's at least two reasons why it happened. The first is the obvious, that Jesus is touched by our pain and suffering. He hurts even although he knows the remedy to the situation, even although he knows what he's about to do, he hates to see his children hurting. He hates to see his brothers, his sisters, his friends in pain. And it moves him to his core. You think, you think it's quiet when Jesus doesn't seem to be around. Let me tell you, his heart aches with your heart in your hour of loss and in your hour of disappointment. And that brings me to the second reason why Jesus would have groaned in his spirit and why he would have felt pain. Because what would have hurt him even more than the brokenness of those human beings in that, in that place. These human beings who he had created in the Garden of Eden for forever friendships. Who he had never designed to fall apart through brokenness and through death. Never designed to know this disappointment. That was not his intention. What what a stark contrast standing by the graveside of Lazarus compared to when he himself breathed life into, the, into that lifeless body of Adam and Eve. He brought them into existence for eternal happiness. What a stark contrast he sees. He sees their brokenness. He knows our pain. He groans. He weeps. But more than that, the only thing that can make it worse than that is the fact that all around him are people who do not believe. <laughs> Death is bad, but death without hope is the end. Death is tragic, but a death without Christ and without the resurrection is heart-wrenching even to God. He knows each one by name, and each one has a place in his kingdom. And each one of us that deny God and choose to go our own way, there will be a hole in heaven forever. Because God knows you by name. He doesn't only know those who know Him. He knows every single one of us by name. 
And he stands at the side of that grave that day. And he sees the brokenness that sinners bring. He sees the death. He sees the pain. He empathizes with us in our brokenness. And yet, as he looks around, he realizes that in their tears, they cannot see that the resurrection is about to take place. They cannot see that he is the resurrection and the life. They, cannot, they do not grasp that they are standing in the presence of the one who ends death. And all they can see is their brokenness and their pain. And that's all they will focus on. And you just, their, their minds are not going beyond. They're not taking hold of him. And I wonder today, when we have prayed to God and we've sent our petitions to God, and it seems to us in our short-sightedness like he's not answering the way we intended. And, and we've suffered loss and we've suffered disappointment. And we've questioned why hasn't God answered us. And we've asked him the question why he hasn't answered us. And it seems like it's deathly silent. And we've asked God to take our pain away because, because it's just too much for us to bear. And yet it doesn't seem to go away. And it goes on and it goes on. And it's been four days and four years and it just goes on and on and we're wondering to ourselves and maybe maybe God weeps in heaven because not only is he touched by our brokenness and our pain but because he realizes that we are just like Mary and Martha and the Jews and we are so focused on the pain and the brokenness that we are unable to recognize he is in our presence we're saying God where are you and he's saying I'm here I'm standing next to the graveside. I'm here. I am your hope. I am your comfort. But we will not see him. We will not see him through our tears and our disappointment, through our questions. Until we get our questions answered, God. You will never see Jesus if that is your attitude. You will never know the comfort of the presence of God until you are willing to say, Though you slay me, yet will I trust you. Until you're willing to say in your brokenness and your pain, you are the Messiah, you are the Son of God, I do not question, I am yours entirely and completely. And though the pain continue and I don't know what the end is and I don't understand the whys, yet I will trust you. You will never know the healing and the presence of Jesus and you inflict pain on the heart of God because he is there, standing with you in your pain, weeping with you. Your tears are his tears, and yet you do not see him. And so Jesus says, take away the stone. <laughs> take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. By now I would be pretty irritated, I've got to tell you. Pretty irritated. I've just described to Martha that I am the resurrection and the life. I've, I've given her some sort of hints. I've gone with them to the graveside. I've, you know, I've inter... I've inter interacted with them and all of this. Now I'm at the graveside. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm asking you to move the stone. Do you not connect the dots here? Right? I mean, do you not see what's about to happen here? But friends, that's what doubt will do to you. It will make you blind so that you cannot see the obvious. You will not see everything that God is doing for you. You will not see his presence in your life as long as you cling to the pain, the brokenness, and the doubt. Take away the stone. We can't, Lord. We've got our reasons. We've got our excuses. And he's saying, just do it. Just do it. Did I not say to you, that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. Then finally, they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that, I, that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the people here standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Now, this is the interesting part of the story. 
Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. Some of them, of course, went away to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus did. And verse 47, then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Jump over to verse 12, chapter 12, sorry, and notice verses 9 and 10. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they, that, that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. In the very beginning of the story, in verse 4, Jesus said to his disciples, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Verse 4. And in chapter 12, you see what the goal was. Now, I want you to notice what Jesus has done here. Because when we are in the midst of our brokenness and our pain and our suffering, and we don't have the questions, what this story, or the answers to those questions, what this story tells me is that God has a plan. That God is actually working out something that we may not see. Mary and Martha did not know what was happening until it happened. And the end result was that Lazarus became the greatest New Testament evidence that Jesus was God Almighty in human flesh. He chose his closest friend to go through the valley of the shadow of death so that he could make his closest friend and honor his closest friend by becoming the greatest evidence that Jesus is who he claimed to be. But the only way Lazarus could be that was if he was to die and go through the disappointment and have his whole family torn apart by doubts and perplexities. It was the only way that Jesus could accomplish this amazing task and honor him to such a great extent. If Jesus had come when Lazarus had, had called for him, when Mary and Martha had called for him, Lazarus would have been just another one of many stories in the New Testament of Jesus' healing. I mean, think about Peter's mother. She was sick. They arrived home from church one Sabbath. There she was, sick with a fever. He heals her. Yeah, great. So what? One amongst many others. Lazarus would have been one amongst them. Maybe it would have been recorded. Maybe it wouldn't have. Who knows? Because John tells us at the end of his gospel that Jesus did many other things and uh, that, that weren't even recorded. Because if we were to record everything, there would be too many books that would cover the, world, cover the earth, fill up, fill up the earth. Do you get what I'm saying to you? If, the, if, he, if, if Jesus had answered the prayer the way they wanted to, the way they prayed with the best intentions and the honesty of heart, Lord, do this for us. It can only be for our good. Lazarus would not have become what he became. He would have been one amongst many, a number in a crowd. But Jesus chose those closest to him to take through the darkest, deepest shadow of death. So that he could give them the most honored of positions. Do you grasp that? So don't think for a moment that because I'm friends with God and now I've gone through tragedy and disappointment and heartache and brokenness. It must be, and sometimes we as Adventists we can say some pretty dumb things. We can imply that tragedy that comes to families is because they're sinners. Oh, you must have done something wrong. I want you to notice what this, what this story teaches. It's not only sinners who suffer and die. It's not only sinners who don't get their prayers answered the way they would like them to be answered. But sometimes the most faithful and the closest to God are called upon to bear the most excruciating of pain and walk through the darkest, deepest valley of the shadow of death. And it is not an indicator that there is something lacking in your experience with God, necessarily. It may, in fact, be because you are close to God that He entrusts you with that kind of ministry. Was Job close to God or far from God? He was so close to God that when Satan claimed the world as his own, God used Job as the evidence that Satan did not reign supreme. It is not necessarily that when tragedy strikes, it's because I've sinned. 
There are times when God judges. We know that. But don't say stupid things to people who are in pain. Sometimes it is those who are closest to God that he knows he can trust to place in a position where they don't have answers, where they can't satisfy their quest for knowledge and understanding. He will place those people in the darkest of places because he knows that their previous experience with him has been sufficient that they will cling to him no matter what. And he can trust them. He can trust them with the deepest, darkest valley of the shadow of death. And when they come out the other side one day in the resurrection, they will occupy a place of great exaltation. They will be honored above the average because of the journey they went through in this life. And you may not have that reward now. But you cannot have that reward unless you first go through the valley of the shadow of death. Lazarus could not become the greatest evidence in the New Testament of the divinity of Christ. He could not become the greatest testimony to the power and the authenticity of the claims of Jesus. To be the resurrection and the life, the answer to the sin problem, the assurance of your redemption. Unless he died. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? So although they prayed for what seemed best to them, Jesus had something better. They couldn't see it at the time, but he had something better. And I encourage you, if you are in that place or you've ever gone into that place, to cling to God no matter what. Do not shake your fist at him in the hour of your brokenness and your pain and your disappointment. Don't cast your blame at his doorstep. But trust him. Have you tasted and have you seen that God is good? Do you have evidences all the way through the Old and the New Testament? That though we go through the valley of the shadow of death, still he is with us. And he is our healing balm. And will you trust your questions to him, though you may not have answers now, and though you may not be satisfied now? Will you reach a point where you will say to him, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And though you slay me, yet I will trust you. And will you wait for the resurrection? At which time you will have your answers? And at which time... In proportion to your suffering and your pain down here, you will be honored and exalted. Will you plan for the future and not let the brokenness of the present discourage you to walking away from him? Becoming a Christian, friends, is not a guarantee that tragedy will never strike. That is a false doctrine preached in Christian churches today. You just accept Jesus, everything's fine after that, nothing goes wrong. Rubbish. You become the special object of Satan's hatred. And he will do whatever he can to destroy you and to destroy your home. And the more authentic you are, and the more serious you are about your commitment to God, and the more thoroughly immersed in God and his word you become, to that extent you can be expect to be attacked by the devil. And sometimes God lets his attacks through because he works out something that's even greater than our best dreams for ourselves on the smoothest road possible. He works out something better for us. And our calling today is to fall at his feet and say, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And though you slay me, Yet I will trust you, because at the cross I see you slayed in my behalf. And I know that if you died like that for me, anything that comes my way, anything that comes my way can only be permitted in love. As difficult as that is to understand in the moment, but I will trust you by faith 
and wait for the resurrection. That is my challenge to you, friends, and I pray that you will be blessed as you make that commitment to God today. Amen. Send his son, they call him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior. you if we're able to kneel as we have our closing prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, around us in our world we see tragedy and brokenness and pain. And we not only see it with our eyes, but we experience it in our lives. There are those in our number, Lord, who have been taken into the darkest valley of the shadow of death. And our hearts ache. And our pain is still there. And it's difficult sometimes to see you through our tears. There are others, Lord, who have not yet experienced that kind of brokenness. And our experiences are still coming. Because one thing is for sure, that if we're not yet broken, this life provides ample opportunity to be broken. So whether we are there, or whether you know in your foreknowledge that some of us are about to get to that place, will you take us back to the stories of Scripture? Will you help us? to trust you, to cling to you, to surrender to you? Will you help us to wait upon you and be patient? Will you grant to us your healing presence? 
And whether or not you choose, Lord, to give us the answers and the whys and the wherefores in this life or not. Help us to trust the testimony of your love that we see as you die upon this cross in our place to ensure our eternal happiness. Help us, Lord, if we have nothing else, nothing in this life to cling to, to cling to the one, that one great fact, that one great evidence. Bind up our hearts. Heal our wounds. And Lord, come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly and bring for us the resurrection and the life. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.